What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 680. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources, and joining me on the line all the way from <laughs> the the frozen wasteland of Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, you had like, what was the temperature yesterday over there? The low was negative 15. The high was like <laughs> three or something. You sent me the report and it was like, we, we might get up to four degrees or whatever. What yep. the heck? It was, it was cold. It was cold. Man, uh, still pretty cold today. Negative one right now, I think. Maybe zero at this point. You've managed to survive though? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, hunker down. It hasn't been too bad. And, uh, you know, the, the wonders of modern heating and all that. Yeah. Get to, get to kind of tough it out here. What about, uh, what about Julie Dog? Like, can she go outside when it's that cold? Like, what actually happens when you have a dog and they need to go outside in four degree weather or whatever, minus fifteen? So, you know, we've got a we got a dog door, and uh, we yeah. watched her go out, and she went a little too far into the yard and was like struggling to get back. Oh no! So what we did was uh, cut shut the dog door, and basically, if she wanted to go out, she'd let us know. And after that incident, she just went and right there and. Uh, you know, went to the bathroom very close to the dog door and hustled back in. But basically, she can't get outside unless we know she's outside, just so she doesn't like get trapped outside or or get stuck or something. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Well, I'm glad that you're uh, staying inside and warm. And I know that one of the ways that you've been passing the time has been playing a little bit of Vintage Cube, and that's what we're going to talk about on the show. We're going to do a kind of uh, State of the Union on Vintage Cube because. Uh, it has changed a fair bit over the last few years, and uh, there's kind of a imperative at Wizards. Uh, we're talking about specifically the Magic Online one that they run, you know, a few times a year, and this is one of the times during the holidays where they they put in new cards and they kind of rotate things through, perhaps to keep it fresh, perhaps to show off some of the new cards from the set, whatever the latest sets are, and uh, that does change things. It really does. You know, I think the average vintage cube is a lot more static. There's a lot of kind of untouchable cards, but they're a little more willing to play around. And we're going to talk about that and uh, other cube related stuff on the show. We're going to be just hanging out. This is a holiday time and it's a, it's a good time for Luis and I just to kind of sit back and chat about some of this stuff and you get to join us for it. Um, Before we get into that, the show is brought to you by TCG Player and ChannelFireball.com. They've uh, teamed up to create a subscription that every Magic player needs. You can get exclusive CFB Pro content and free shipping and tracking on direct by TCG Player orders, plus bonus bucks and awesome promos at TCGPlayer.com. For just $6.99 a month, you get all those things included in there. And uh, we do have a link in the show notes for if you want to sign up for that or if if you want to pick up anything over at the TCG Player Marketplace, which is, you know, the number one place to go to uh, pick up your magic cards these days. And uh, they have a marketplace that lets you compare prices, conditions, shipping speeds, all that kind of stuff directly. And you can pick the option that fits your budget, fits your needs the best over at TCG Player. If you do use that link that I mentioned in the show notes, um, it lets them know that we sent you over there. It's an affiliate link, and we do appreciate you doing so. Um, You can also support the show directly via the Patreon. It's patreon.com slash limited resources. All the information is there, and uh, you get a thank you card and a sticker in the mail no matter what level you sign up for, and you get some cool perks as you kind of work your way up. And we want to say thank you so much to everybody who supports us over on Patreon. It does mean the world to us. Um, we did get a question from Matthew for Patreon question of the week, and it's, um, Matthew would love an update on Luis and Gabby's vintage cube, otherwise known as Gabby's vintage cube. Would it be possible to get a list to work from if we wanted to build from our own use? Um, and he also wants to know if there's something that makes your cube unique. Uh, so having updated the cube in a couple sets, just mm-hmm. kind of basically the way we end up doing it is every time we're going to play it, play it or get together uh, to to cube, tend to update it and haven't just haven't done that in a little bit. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, I can I can when I update it, I'll, I'll I'll let you know. We can we can put in a link. It's just it, for the for the time being, it's not updated. Okay. And it it was hosted on um, cube. Cube Tutor, I think, which was now is now defunct. So uh, uh, that that is unfortunate as well. Okay. Um, and then Matthew wanted to know if there's anything that made your vintage cube unique. Um, 
I don't think anything in particular. It's uh, good. It's a cube that has a, some good gameplay. I mean, it's just got a lot of the classic cards that, that you'd expect in Vintage Cube that mm-hmm. we find fun. And um, I don't know. It's just like a pretty tight list. It's got a couple – like it had the lands package before the Magic Online Vintage Cube did, for mm. example. That one was pretty fun too. Uh, and uh, overall, it just it's just a good Vintage Cube. It's got some silver-bordered cards, I suppose. But no, it's not particularly heavily themed. Would you uh, would you say that it's it's archetype driven? Like, do, do you know what you're gonna take after your first, you know, maybe five picks? Do you know like exactly the type of archetype you're going for, or is it like more free flowing? Oh, it's definitely there. There's definitely archetypes. You know, okay. there's blue red combo decks, and like you said, the lands packaging green, and uh, you know, th- there's a variety of things that can kind of kind of come together that way. Is it uh, does it lean storm? There is there are storm cards, but it's not like nuts storm where it's got every storm card in existence or anything like that. Yeah, especially with your play group, everybody would just be trying to do that every time, and then you wouldn't get to do it anymore. Um, okay, so let's do. Uh, we'll start things off with a vintage cube crack a pack, and again, vintage cube is kind of a broad strokes term that applies to to cubes that have the power, you know, moxin and that type of stuff in it usually. Um, and it can apply in this case directly to the Magic Online version of it because that's the most universal list. But you know, th- there's this is going to have a lot of similarities with a lot of people's vintage cubes. So, our first card out is Nurturing Peatland. Peatland. That's the uh, what is it like the Horizon Canopy variant that makes yeah. uh, black and green. Yeah, I mean these lands are okay. You end up playing them a decent amount of the time if you have some of these colors, but there's yeah. certainly nothing that you're too excited about. Do, do you ever try to build around these in the sense of playing like excavator or ways to get lands back to like make that card draw repeat? Well, yeah, you would play those in the same deck, but it's honestly, but because it uses your land drop every turn, it's really not yeah. that effective uh, of yeah. a strategy. Like, yes, technically, if you have like Dried of the Elysian Grove and ex- Ramen Up Excavator. You can like play this, sack it, draw a card, play another land, or play this again. But most of the time, you're going to want to use those cards with wastelands. Yeah, I've had that exact thing set up, and it's just okay. It, it does. It isn't. Re- it doesn't feel broken relative to other stuff that you can do in the cube. Um, next card out, the all timer, Jace the Mind Sculptor, better than all. Yeah, this is a this is a fine card to first pick. I'm not unhappy when I first pick a Jace. In fact, I think I did that yesterday in one of my streams. Yeah, it's still good, right? It still holds oh, up. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Because there, because one thing that I think that we're going to be touching on throughout the course of today on the show is that that isn't always true. So some of the cards that you sort of um, in years past have just said, "Well, that's just a great card." They actually do slip a little bit. Um, like if I had to say if Jace has gotten stronger or weaker over time, it's been weaker, though still quite powerful. Uh, next, Wheel of Fortune, two and a red. All players discard their hands and draw seven cards. Wheel's fine too. Uh, it's if you're if you want to be storming or you know combo oriented, Wheel is a good card. But uh, I don't think it's better than Jace. He, even if I wanted to draft Storm, which I frequently do, I'd still rather start with Jace because I think it's just crazy to start with Wheel over Jace when they're comparable in the Storm deck. Wheel's a little better, and Jace is 100 times better in every other deck. If you if you see a draw seven like Wheel of Fortune or Time Twister, what, what's the what's the ranking in your head of things you want to do with it? Is it like is Storm number one? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the main way. There's the, the the two things you can do are like storm combo where you're trying to wheel and time twister into, you know, a bunch of spells, brain freeze, tendrils, whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, or there's Narset, Leovold, Shieldred combo where you have these three cards. And we'll talk more about Shieldred, but uh, that punish your opponent. And they make draw sevens asymmetrical either by having Narset slash Leovold make it so your opponent doesn't draw cards. They draw one card and that's it. And you get a fresh seven or Shieldred, which gains you 14 and deals 14 to them. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, I've, I saw you do that on your stream and I was like, that is not tendrils, but it looks a lot like tendrils when you fire it off. <laughs> and sometimes you just cast Shieldred as a four or five death touch and your opponent can't do anything about it. Yeah, it's, it's been impressive. Um, next is, wow, this card's still in the queue, Biogenic Ooze. Yeah, I, I, I haven't I haven't really been uh, too impressed by, by that. I mean, it's fine if you have like um, 
something like opposition or or ways to ways to do that. Though I think that might this might actually be an old cube list because this biogenic ooze I don't think is actually in the cube anymore. Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> All right, well we'll just plow through. We had to kind of uh, we, we put producer Jeff on like five minutes to find us a <laughs> vintage yeah, cube yeah. bag that doesn't really exist. It was a bit of a tall order. I was eating pasta. Like there was a lot going on pre-show here. So we're going to just skip that one. But Lanaware Elves, that one's still in the cube. Yeah. I mean, I think you should take Jace over Lanaware Elves, but Lanaware Elves is, is, a, is a pretty good uh, pretty good opener as well. Um, and then Leon and Relic Warder, which, which is still in the cube. That's the white, white 2-2 two, two that kind of gobbles up an enchantment. Or artifact until it leaves battlefield. Yeah, kind of a staple wrong. in the in the white decks. Nothing wrong with relic order. I mean, it's not a card you're going to take early, but it is a good card. Uh, Mox Diamond. This is a th I, this is an interesting one because I see you play this quite often, but I know a lot of people are pretty afraid to play it just because they you don't know, straight up card disadvantage just to get a mana source into play, and it can be kind of difficult to figure out when the right time is to play a Mox Diamond and when it isn't. I like it in decks that are doing unfair things, whether that's accelerating out Planeswalkers or card draw or storming or, or what have you. I don't particularly like it in like a low curve, fair, more fair deck. So I see. A do, one for one base to, deck, you wouldn't like it as much. Yeah, you do kind of have to to know what you're what you're trying to get up to. Like you wouldn't you, play it in like a like one of the more popular archetypes in this cube. It's just like a blue white control deck. You You wouldn't play it in that, would you? It's not that good in those decks, no. Okay. Uh, Devoted Druid is next. This is a very nice one. One and a green for a zero two that taps to add green, but you can put a minus one, minus one counter on it to untap it. So you get kind of a one shot of getting two mana out of it for a turn. Worse than Land Elves in general. Just yeah. it costs two instead of one. You'd rather just have your cards that cost one instead. Yeah. Do you ever Thousand Year Storm? I don't find that card to be very effective, no. Because it can kind of be its own storm card, right? Where you can like get it on the battlefield. And if you either have a ton of mana or get to untap, you can kind of do things. What I've always found is that <clears throat> the nature of Vintage Cube is that you do need to keep up with your neighbor, <laughs> right? Like you can't just sit there and do nothing until you cast Thousand Year Storm. And then you're like, haha, I have five spells in my hand that all cost one mana or free or two mana. And I'm going to just go off now. It's more like by the time you get Thousand Year Storm down, you kind of don't have anything left. I mean, that's been my experience at least. Yeah, it, it it's it's like going to be one of the last cards you play. And right. that ends up not being uh, really what you want to what you want it to, to be because you can't, it does nothing if it's the last card you play. Right. Okay. So Jace, Lana or elves kind of have our eye a little bit here. What about underground yeah. C? I still think Jace is just a better blue card than underground C. Okay. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at. All right. Uh, M breath shield breaker. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good card for mono red. Part of the keys uh, to, to winning with mono red is, is to be able to, to kill your opponent's uh, artifacts to slow them down, but I don't think I'm a shield breaker's better than Jace or Lanor Elves. Sylvan Karyatid. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, I like Sylvan Karyatid. I like Lanor better just because the one mana going one into three is so much more powerful than going two into four. Yeah. E even if you have decent force. Okay, here's a heavy hitter for me. I I'm curious where you're at, but I have such a hard time passing this and it's it's sister card. It's Ponder. And I'm, and I'm talking about Preordain as the other one. I absolutely love these cards in Cube, Luis. I, I can't stop. Uh, they're probably my most first picked cards or cards like Ponder and Preordain. I mean, they are fantastic. There's really nothing wrong with uh, starting with such a good cheap spell that helps, you know, kind of speed you up and get, get your things going. Chase is still better than Ponder. I feel like yeah. I have to say that a lot, but, uh, yeah. One of the, one of the things you really want to do in vintage cube, and this is true of arena cube too, is you want to spend your early picks on cards that are effective cards that do things. And mm -hmm. Ponder doesn't affect the board, but it does help you enact the rest of your game plan in a way that a lot of cards won't. Yeah. Also, there's two aspects to cards like Ponder that really are emphasized in the Vintage Cube. And one of them is just cheap cards really, really matter. Like you just want to be doing stuff all the time. 
and ponder is a great way to to have something to do on turn one or to fill in a, a mana gap a little bit later. You know, you play a three drop plus a ponder on turn four, something like that, and give you those options. But also, ponder tends to scale with the strength of the cards that you're playing, <clears throat> right? Especially if they're a little bit more conditional or if you have some cards that are broken in your deck, right? And Imagine you play Ponder and Standard. It would be really, really solid, right? Because some of your cards are better than the rest, but the power curve is a lot flatter. Here in Vintage Cube, it's Singleton, and you might have, you know, between one and three cards that are just stupid, right? You know, cards like Ancestral Recall or something like that, where it's just like, oh my God, like this is just so far out of whack compared to the rest of my deck. You might have specific types of cards, like even just looking in this pack, like a Wheel of Fortune, right? that's the type of card that can do something really outrageous to the game. And if you can set it up, Wheel of Fortune can be the way that you can win the game. As Luis mentioned, you might have one of those lock pieces and you get to draw seven and they get to draw one and discard the rest. You know, that's probably a win for you. Um, you may be able to use Wheel of Fortune to fuel your huge storm turn, where you may only have a couple of those in your whole library, those type of draw sevens or those unique effects, you know, that are difficult to find and that you don't have very many of and ponder scales with those because it lets you see three cards. And if you don't want, you could even see a fourth uh, to try to find your best, most powerful stuff. So that's that's why I tend to do it. Also, it's blue, which is, you know, I often want to be in blue or touching blue in the cube. It is the best color in the cube usually. And uh, so that's a thing too. But Jace the Mind Sculptor is one of those cards that, we were, that I was just referencing, one of those game-changing cards that you can find and take over with. Uh, two more cards in this pack, Shriekma. Shriekma, I think, is on balance worse than most of the two-mana removal spells. Like, I'd rather just have an Infernal Grasp most of the time. Okay. Just the fact that it's sorcery and doesn't hit artifacts, both those kind of do add up. Yeah, and, they uh, do. Yeah. And I think that you, you do have to watch out for that. Yeah, and any of these that don't hit land, like, you know, creature lands can be tough. Last one is, hey, if you want to go a different direction, how about a Goblin Guide? Well, I mean, it's a valid strategy playing mono red. It wins. It wins quite a bit. Uh, I don't think Goblin Guide. I wouldn't take it over Jace. I think if you strictly wanted to win, Jace is still a little better. But Goblin Guide's close. My guess is Thalia Guardian of Thraben's better a better pick than any of these cards in terms of like just yeah. win shares and pick pick one pack one. What if it was um, Ragavan instead of Goblin Guide here? Mm. I'd probably take Ragavan. I think yeah. Ragavan is is just obscene. I mean, if it's a one mana play that if you have it in your opening hand and they don't kill it, you you run out of the game almost immediately. You're drawing yes. an extra card and a lotus petal every turn it hits. Yes, like yes. absurd. And then even late game with the dash, it, it's still pretty strong. So I like Ragavan. Plus, Ragavan's great in your blue red deck, but also in your mono red deck and also in your red green deck. Like it's just a good card. Yeah, yeah, super high power level for the mana that you pay. Okay, so there's our crack a pack. Um, we're both taking Jace. I'm, I'm a close on ponder, but I would take Jace. Is that where you land too? Yeah, I would take Jace. Yeah, Jace is great. Okay, so let's talk about uh, big picture before we dive into to card by card stuff. Um, how would you say the vintage cube has changed in not just in like the card construction, but like what are the fundamentals that have changed over the past, say, year and a half to two years or so? when you think of sort of classic vintage cube to kind of where we're at right now? So I think, I think vintage cube has gotten generally faster. And I think mm. that's something that, that you do want to, to keep in mind. Like it is a very strong, you know, brutal format, but things have even gotten faster and cards like remember Karn liberated the seven mana Karn. Yeah. Like, that got that played used, all the time. It used to be a card that you would first pick and like, not feel bad about it. Like you'd be yeah. like, okay, you know, I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's uh, that's true anymore. I don't think that's a card you should be taking. And you know, there's there's other cards in that vein, and, and it's really just interesting trying to figure out like what is actually good here. And the more expensive cards have gotten a little worse, and the cheaper cards tend to tend to get better, kind of as a result. Yeah, I mean, are you? Do, would you say that you're leaning more towards higher variance broken things assuming that you're you're drafting to win you know um or solid fair strategies that kind of do the same thing every time like where on that scale are you is it oh i'm 
I definitely am trying to do broken stuff if I can. Okay. I, I think that I think that it's a, that's a really good place to be. Um, in general, I would say that if you're not doing something broken, you have to have a pretty good way to stop your opponent from doing something broken. Mm-hmm. So that could that could be as easy as counter spells. It could be speed, like these aggro decks. You know, they they end up. Uh, going very quickly in order to do that. And uh, I think that you've got, so counter spells, aggression, or going more broken than someone else. Like like a green, a mono green deck you don't consider broken. And that's part of the reason mono green is a lot better in legacy cube than it is in vintage cube is that you end up in a spot where uh, you're, you go off by pl- doing something on turn three and then, uh, you know, turn four, and then they've already killed you by then. Yeah. But in general, I would say that uh, you you have to either be ending the game around turn four or five, and that doesn't sound super fast, but that is pretty fast for a cube format. It is. Or significantly disrupting your opponent on the way there. Right. Yeah, because I think mono green's a really great example of kind of a checkpoint from before to now. Because yeah. the deck itself actually hasn't changed. Almost all the pieces are still there. There's still a ton of mana elves in the format. There's still Guy's Cradle. There's still a bunch of colorless payoffs and green payoffs. There's still Crater Hoof, Natural Order, right? All of the pieces are still there. But I would say a couple of years ago or, you know, maybe one or two iterations ago, you know, that was a strategy that I was quite happy to be in. It felt powerful. It felt like a really nice balance between po- powerful and consistent. If you went, you know, turn one elf, turn two elf of some, you know, one mana elf into two mana elf, whether it was Rafelis or Devoted Druid or whatever, like you could do some pretty nasty stuff on turn three. And by turn four, you could cast Karn, right? Like the good example that you just brought up. And that felt good. That felt like that was enough to win most of the games. And you just needed to kind of get the balance right on elves and payoffs and a few mid range things, get your land sorted out, that type of thing. But nowadays, I wouldn't say I run from that. Like I'm not like shutting that strategy out completely. It still can do the thing, but it feels underpowered. It feels like old school now. Like it does, like, I don't know. I feel like making a Karn, like you mentioned, or even some of these other newer payoffs, you know, even like a cityscape leveler or something like that on an early turn is just okay. Like it, it's powerful. It can win you a few games, but before it felt like if you got to do that, like you were good to go, like you were probably going to win that game. You lost the games where you didn't do that or where you got disrupted and they killed two of your elves early or something like that. But it doesn't feel like that now that that feels like it's a little bit behind the times. Yeah. And that's more, more of a <laughs> legacy cube play gameplay, modern cube gameplay than it is vintage cube gameplay. Exactly. Where before though, I felt like I had a l- l- nice little lane on taking elves because my, you know, the joke was always like there, it's like a mox, right? Like if you play it on turn yeah. one, you know, you can untap and, and you know, it, it feels similar and it, and it doesn't anymore. Do you know why? Like, is it, the the sort of overall arc of magic cards in general that are you know they tend to get more powerful over time compl- or power creep etc i think that is it i mean now you have uh you know ragavan right you have shield dread you you these are the kind of cards hex drinker even that's like a relatively recent last year or two edition two years i guess three years i don't know but hex drinker is kind of it's kind of funny your opponent plays when you're like ha, oh, right they're gonna level that thing up and then like not that many turns later, it's a 6-6 six, six pro everything, and you're like, oh, I'm going to die to that I'm very quickly. That. Yeah, I respect that card a lot now. Oh, yeah, me too. I think yeah. it's a, I think it's a great card. Yeah. And uh, it just, in general, like, it's not only the cards have gotten better, people have also gotten better. You mm-hmm. play against fewer people playing green, black, blue piles of random good cards. Yes. You play against, you play against fewer green, white ramp decks, you know, yeah. like, there, there's yeah. just a, a higher general... Uh, quality level when it comes to people playing the games as well as the cards in the cube. And I think that combines in a way that really, I mean, people have gotten better and the cards have gotten better. So everything is faster and more brutal. I mean, it kind of reminds me of, uh, of the arena cube, actually the arena cube is like really just popping now. Like if you, if you don't have a, if you're on the draw and you don't have a play on turn two, it feels like you're really far behind. So dead. Yeah. And there seems to be a lack overall of great, you know, early stuff. So it's really sought after in the draft. If you can get just a good curve. I remember looking at the arena cube open, um, stuff on Twitter when people were posting the decks that they did well with in the drafts 
and it was always heavily. I always felt like the people that did really well had a lot of one and two mana spells. And the people that were like, couldn't quite get there with this were like light on those and started their curve at three and four. And it's like, well, yeah. And it's because there's not that many. I feel like it feels it, it. I don't know if it's true. Like, I don't know if we can look at how the cube's broken down by mana cost, but it feels like I'm always trying to get those early cards. We're like in vintage cube, for example, it doesn't feel that way. There's a lot, there's a lot of cheap cards. Around. Yeah, I mean, you got to the point where I'm like, oh, Blood Chief's Thirst, what an awesome first pick. You <laughs> yeah, know, that's we, we got thing. there. Yeah, yeah, and we're, but, and we're and, and our our favorite card, the would you call it the Craven Inspector, Craven Inspector? Oh yeah, hard <laughs> evidence. Yep, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but 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 you look at that right, and you also look at cards like Minsk and Boo, Timeless Heroes, a new Planeswalker. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. like, first of all, that card's getting passed really late, but it's also busted. It's uh, so it's like two red green. Here, let me look up exactly what what it does. Just, just to make, just to make sure. So it's a uh, two red green for uh, a planeswalker, and it's got three loyalty. When it enters the battlefield or during your upkeep, you put a one-one legendary red hamster with uh, trample and haste. This is Boo. Uh-huh. Uh, you can plus one it to put three plus one plus one counters on a creature that has trample and haste, which is really weird. Except it gives you that. And you can minus to it, sack a creature, and when you do it, does X damage or to any target where X is that creature's power, and you draw that many cards if that creature was a hamster. What the heck? So so look at this. You play this and you get a 4-4 four, four trample haste immediately because you get a 1-1 one, one and you plus 1. Yeah. If they kill it, you get it again on your upkeep. If they don't <laughs> kill it, next turn you can make it a 7-7 seven, seven and hit for 7, or you can hit for 4 and throw it at something and draw 4 cards. That's insane. It's yeah. just completely uh, just absurd. The only reason this card hasn't fully caught on, although you do see it more now, so it, the, the, the secret's out a bit on it, <laughs> is because of the color pair it's in. It, it's traditionally been arguably the worst color pair in the Vintage Cube is green-red. Yeah, but I mean, this this card is just worth splashing for. I mean, yeah. the, the secret's been out because there was a, a number of legacy premiere events on Magic Online that just kept getting won by effectively blue-white splashing Minsk and Boo. Oh, like, really? Oh yeah, the, 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 it's a it is a very uh, oh, wow. strong card, and even in Legacy, people were were using it well. So it's it, it's a nuts card, and and cards like that are what kind of what speed up the cube. You know, you just have you just have a faster and more aggressive, not not necessarily in getting attacked, but just you have to be doing stuff early. But it's the cool thing about the Vintage Cube, and this is where one where one place where I think it actually has an advantage over the Arena Cube is. You get behind in the arena cube, or you're on the draw, especially, and like they go one drop, two drop on the play. Not that many things that get you out of it. Vintage cube, yeah, you could always be the one with the mocks or or something along those lines, and end up in a spot where you're able to 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 kind of just use your own busted cards to go over the top of their draw. Yeah, you know, I, I see this stuff come out in other cards too that were traditionally considered again like too good or too whatever, like like bribery is one you know, that comes to mind that was, I mean, there was a lot of people that were, that just hated even having it in the cube at all because they felt it was, well, they felt it was a bit unfun, but also too powerful. And like, I don't know, do you worry about bribery these days? No, I mean, it's a playable card, but yeah, definitely that's, it's that's not, it's not, it's not a, not a busted one. And, and uh, we don't have it in our cube just because don't like how it plays, but I think oh. at this point it would probably be fine. It's definitely not too good or anything close to that. Um, so yeah, I mean, when, when you're cubing here, I think what you really want to focus on is like, what do you, what is your game plan? How are you gonna either be broken or stop broken decks, and where, like, how are you gonna do that quickly? What, what is your way to either interact or accelerate? Both those, accelerate is the, is the preferred way, like if you can get mocks or soaring or that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. But you can't always get that. In interaction, there is a lot of it. So there, there are a lot of ways to battle against your opponent doing stuff like that. So I, I have to ask, do you like this direction? Yeah, I, I I've liked the vintage cube quite a bit. Okay. Uh, the, the, even the recent one, I'm you know eight drafts in or something, seven drafts in, and and it's been it's been very fun. So okay, uh, let's take a look at some of the changes that were made uh, recently to the cube. I'm gonna kind of I know you have a few you want to talk about, but I'm just gonna go. There's actually not that many, so I'm just gonna go through and just talk about anything notable if it stands out. So they they brought in arcane proxy. That's that the prototype that lets you kind of snapcaster a thing for the reality yeah. chip. And that seems like a good one. Like the reality chip never really became a reality, reality chip. At was, all. Yeah. yeah, it was nothing. So that's so. cool. So, and that's, you know, that's a blue card or a, or a colorless card. Um, they put in Argoth, 
Sanctum of Nature, which is the one that lets you mill yourself and make a bear for four mana, which seems too slow for Vintage Q, but uh, the mill might be a thing. They took out Volrath's Stronghold, which is another card that people just weren't really using. So, so the reason they put put in Argoth is because they also have uh, Titania in there, yeah. Voice of Gaia, so you can meld them. And right, I, I, I do want to say when when you look at this sort of this sort of situation, they do have a mandate. Clearly, whether it's I, I guess I don't know if it's stated or unstated of put cards from the most recent set in the cube. Right, like that's the whole point, right? I mean, they, yeah. they release sets, so I basically give a pass to any cards from the new set. Like sometimes, you know, they they come in. Like I don't expect Titania and Argoth to stay in very long. If they're in here in two more iterations, at that point I'm I, I'm gonna be like, okay, well these kind of you, you tried them, they weren't good. It's time, time, time to get a move on. Sorry, Ludovic, you know, or whatever. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I wonder if they flag them, you know, for where these will be in for a cycle. But like, because the disaster would be is if it wasn't fully curated in the sense of like flagging some cards for temporary use, where like. In, in two years, we're just like, why is this card still here? You know, that type of thing. And we've had a few cards sneak through like that, but they do generally keep pretty good tabs on the thing. Um, this sounds a little bit weird. Aurelia, the war leader, makes an appearance here. That's the two red, red, white, white, three, four, flying vigilance haste. And whenever it attacks for the first time each turn, untap all creatures you control. After this phase, there is an additional combat phase. That's replacing... General Ferris Rokirich, which I don't even know what that is anyway, but that was the three, the three one hexproof from monocolor. Oh that, uh, yeah. Yeah. And you, you cast golems. a multicolored spell. You got to go, you got to go along. Yeah. All right. So get that guy out of here. But why are really, what uh, aggro really deck in this thing is, wants a six drop? Or really the word is such a bizarre addition because it's not new or good. Right. <laughs> so, <I> just, uh, <laughs> what's going on? This is a bizarre one. So maybe a pet card there. Uh, Obnixilis, the adversary, is out. That's the three mana Planeswalker Obnixilis, which is actually kind of an interesting okay card. Bringing in standard all-star Blood Tithe Harvester. The funny thing is I think Obnixilis might be worth, worse than, than, than Blood Tithe Harvester. Blood Tithe Harvester has has actually like – it looked like a joke the first time I saw it, but it's been pretty good. Like, Does it have a home good. in the cube? I just can't um, imagine playing this card. I think I would play the, the the problem I have with Blood Tithe Harvester, I guess, isn't so much that Blood Tithe Harvester isn't playable. It's that I don't really want to be a deck that has base black red ver, ver, mana very much. Right. And you need to be. Yeah, because because a two mana three two that uh can sack to to destroy a creature or can and then leaves a blood behind is good. It's just I don't think this one actually gets there. Well, and it's also worth noting that like the amount that you can do with this uh, of minus X minus X is twice the number of blood tokens. Like there are a couple of other cards that make blood tokens in the queue, but it's not like they're flying around. There are. I, I, I think, I, I think there is one. What is it? it? Is it cost single black? What is that card? Oh, that was in the arena cube. The, the, the blood heart fountain. Okay. Then I must be thinking of that. There may not be any others then. Yeah, I so I think this card's fine. I think Obnixilis was really weak, and okay, no one so, ever played it. So, so it this just, is it this is fine. My guess is this doesn't last super long, but I mean, it's a little more interesting than like a Dreadbore or whatever. Yeah, and of course the question is, well, what else would you put in? Because remember, they have to keep the color balances intact. It's not like this could become some sweet white card that we haven't seen. It needs to be a, a black, red, gold card. Uh, Bone Shredder is out. That's a... Yeah, maybe perhaps past its due, but a long, long, long time cube card. And in is Braids Arisen Nightmare. That's the new Braids, the the one black, black, three, three Braids. Right. Kind of cool. Yeah, I'm not I, I'm not too impressed with either uh, uh, of those, honestly. I like, like the idea. I mean, obviously, the Braids Arisen Nightmare is way more interesting than Bone Shredder, right? Like, yeah, just yeah. you might be able to do some some type of. Uh, what is it? Not stacks. What is it? Smoke stack? Yeah, stacks. Some like yeah. make you make you sack stuff it's going on. Uh, exploration is out. This is exploration is, is the one that's an enchantment that lets you play an additional land on each year. Turns just one additional land, and they brought in for that bushwhack. I like bushwhack. <laughs> okay, I mean, I don't. <laughs> 
Although I did get bushwhacked pretty good uh, yesterday when I was playing in this cube. Really brutal. So I went, um, on my turn, I played um, a Noble Hierarch, and my opponent played Ignoble Hierarch. And on their turn, they attacked with it and then bushwhacked my Noble Hierarch with their stupid one, two. <laughs> I'm like, come on. How does the Noble Hierarch not win that fight? But it doesn't. This card's like not good, though, right? No, no, I don't think it's particularly good. Again, okay. it's a little flex slot from one of the most recent sets, but I don't think it's gonna. The problem is fighting is too weak, and one mana go going to get to get uh, a basic land is too weak. So yeah, putting two things that are too weak together still doesn't quite get you there. Unlike in limited, where both of these things are are good. Right, uh, Emrakul, the promise end is out. So that's not the fifteen mana. That's a thirteen no, I, mana. But I, that's I, I was fine. really I worried for a card. second once. On my stream, someone said that the, they took an Emrakul. I was like, what? But no more, like, no oh, more sneak attacking. <laughs> and it's like, oh, the promised end is just whatever. Like, yeah, I don't think cares? I don't think that card really gets there. They brought in Cityscape Leveler, which I, I thought like was it. a really cool addition. And I played it in a ramp deck and I don't like it. Um, it feels underpowered for, for Vintage Cube. You can't hit lands, which sometimes you, you do need to do. Yes, being able to blow up a permanent's good. And yes, the unearth is very cool. Like that that part is really neat because it's just a ton of damage and an additional thing. But man, there's a decent amount of the time that you want to hit a mana source and it gives them a tap power stone token. And like they can actually use it in the vintage cube quite a bit. Yeah. I, I it did I, not do true. what I wanted. I'll tell you that. Sure, sure. I, I, I haven't had a chance to play with it yet. I'm just saying, like, in theory, it sounds pretty good. That's what I thought, too. You try it out, and I, I think you won't like it. What I thought it was is kind of like a baby uh, old school, uh, what's his name? Um, the Eldrazi, 11 mana. Sure, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, Ulamog, sorry. Ulamog, thing. but it's not. <laughs> um, Portent is out for consider. So I, I think that that's a fine uh swap in terms of power level regardless but also portent is just a really unpleasant card to play with the fact that you have to then wait a turn a half turn cycle to draw is just like just don't put this card in it's just a it's just kind of an annoying card yeah and you know this goes to carmen handy wrote an article called i'll put it in a link in the notes called holiday vintage cube 22 2022 outlining her rationale for making these changes. And this is what she said about that one. Lesson number one, strength isn't everything. Not all changes made in cubes are made in the name of making them stronger. Uh, in this update, for example, I've made the decision to cut portent for consider, which is a stronger uh, on raw rate is debatable, but it certainly isn't a unilateral upgrade, though consider is certainly more fun to play with over the, over the course of a thousand games. Sometimes weaker cards can even enable synergies and cubes to make archetypes more reliable than they normally would be in vintage cubes, for example. Having a card that contributes a bit more to graveyard synergies rather than raw selection is a huge boon for archetypes like Reanimator or even some of the Goblin Welder fueled shenanigans therein. So that's an interesting note, right? It isn't always one direction that, you know, in this case that Carmen's trying to just go, this card's better, it's going in. It, it also can be like, well, this one's a little different or this one plays a little better. And uh, so we'll make a, a little adjustment there. And I like that. I mean, important's just annoying. Yeah. Um, disenchant, out. And instead sure, it's dis destroy evil. I don't really buy destroy evil either, honestly. But I... Uh, don't really think that disenchants that exciting either. So I don't, I don't, and it doesn't really bother me, whichever one. Man, you really don't it. have any uh, emotional connection to these cards, do you? Not so much, no. You, you're more interested in how they play. Um, Look, if as long as, as long as Riftwind Cloud's gate is in, which it currently is, uh -huh. uh, I'm not complaining. And th that yeah. one took a little break, but is back, you know? I used to say that about Mana War, and then they replaced it with like, three like strictly better cards uh aura shards is out nobody ever played that and this one is interesting because it's totally different effect it's a latimer's call which is green white instant search your library for a creature card reveal it put it into your hand and then shuffle your library it's a little bit lost because of the color pair right like it's hard to like this is a powerful effect you could use this in a lot of different decks but the fact that it costs both green and white makes it really difficult to make it work yeah, and also like spending two man a two mana surcharge on top of any creature is there's not that many creatures that are worth doing that for. Right. Even I, even if you have a bit of a toolbox. Yeah, I'm thinking Splinter Twin or something like that, and and it doesn't fit. 
Uh, Carrion Feeder is out. That's a sacrifice outlet. Instead, it's Evolved Sleeper. So, you know, a much, much different look uh, for a black one drop here than what we had before. Uh, it's. I still think black is going to struggle because it just has no real like theme it's not like the like what is a base black deck trying to do like they took out some of the rinky dink sacrifice effects but evolved sleeper still like what 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 bit deck do you envision evolved sleeper being good in i mean the only thing i ever want is to see my opponent play an evolved sleeper and then i'll feel some sense of relief that they haven't figured out the cube yet uh yeah. assassin's trophies out and fiend artisan is in this is an unexcited this one to me is like a card that very few people played for a card that nobody's going to play. Yeah, basically. Um, Nighthawk Scavenger is out. Good. And they put in Gix Yogmoth Praetor. So that's pretty cool. I like that change. Yeah, I think Gix is also probably not good enough, but at least if you go Evolve yeah. Sleeper into a two drop into Gix, you're really, you, you are getting somewhere. Yeah. Uh, Sedgemore Witch is out. Graveyard Trespassers. And these are the type of cards that need to happen if black is going to become a thing, like something that can uh, apply pressure and disrupt your opponent at the same time they took out cultivate and put in kodama's reach lol yeah yeah They're just and maybe the artwork technically uh, you can splice desperate ritual onto kodama's reach or through the breach onto kodama's reach so i guess it's slightly better it is arcane isn't it um tamio completed sage is out and coma cosmos serpent is in i like coma i think it's actually a cool ramp target but I just I don't know that I care that much about this just because um, that color pair is not short on things to ramp towards. Yeah, exactly. Um, Voltaic Visionary is out. Good. I never saw anybody do anything cool with that. And they put Krark the Thumbless in. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, uh, flip a coin. If you lose the flip, return that spell to its owner's hand. If you win, copy it. And it has partner too. But <laughs> This card's fun to play with, but yeah. it is not a card that... I think is that good? <laughs> I mean, yeah. you cast this and you just hope to hope to win some flips and then you get you get to really go off. It's good with cheap spells cuz when you cast lightning bolt, you lose the flip, recasting it's not a big deal, but doubling it is really nice. Yeah. And, and I mean, this is a perfect change, right? Voltaic Visionary wasn't doing anything and this is like a funny cool card. Seagate Stormcaller is out. That's good. I you know, I had higher hopes for it. I was able to do a couple of cool things with it. Time Walk's kind of the classic, but it um it never actually really came together and it always felt too clunky for the cube and they put in ledger shredder. Yeah. I mean, I miss seeing it strong color because I think it was really fun to make time walk decks with it, but uh -huh. if you didn't get time walk, the card wasn't that good. So I think it's uh certainly a fine card to 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 ro rotate and move move on. Yeah, and shredder is actually relevant in vintage cube because people very often play two spells in a turn. Uh, Swift Reconfiguration is out, and it's now Lauren of the Third Path, which is the two and a white, two one Vigilance, and when it ETBs, it destroys an artifact or enchantment, and you could tap it to have both people draw a card. Yeah, That's good a card. Very interesting card, yeah. And, you know, having an, another Reclamation Sage in another color, is, th those are excellent in Vintage Cube. Uh, here's one that Carmen also talked about. Uh, Halana and Elena Partners is out. That's the four mana one. And in is Maria Scholar of Antiqu Antiquity, which is the three mana, three, three, one green, uh, red. And it says tap an untapped non-token artifact you control to add green. And you can tap two untapped non-token artifacts you control to exile the top card of your library. And you may play at this turn. What do you, what do you think about that change? Cause the Hana and Elena, uh, Helana and Elena partners was not getting play. Yeah, I mean that card. Basically, I, I I really like the philosophy of take out a card that no one really cares about, regardless. That's just not getting there in any circumstances, and put in a more narrow card that, in the right deck, could be awesome, but it's probably useless to most people. I think that's a fine approach. In fact, it's a great approach because mm -hmm. there's plenty of generically powerful cards. There's no shortage of lightning bolts, remands, you know, him to Turox in the cube. Right? These cards are just mm -hmm. good. Putting in Maria, a Scholar of Antiquity, like, yes, this card might not see much play. In fact, it probably won't see much play. But every now and then, someone with a ton of artifacts will put this in their deck and have a reason to have a red-green artifact deck, like red-green-blue maybe, instead of blue-white. Yeah. And it could be really fun, I think. So I I think, that it's a, I think that it's a good place to be. Yeah, this was the rationale from Carmen. 
She said, with this Cube update, I made the decision to cut Halan and Lena partners for Miria. I've spoken more than once about the struggles of finding strong gruel cards that can compete in the vintage at the vintage cube level. So axing a generic rate card for a sweet build around is a no brainer. I'm optimistic about the decks that Maria can enable that otherwise wouldn't have been built. So that's just huge upside, right? To, even if you're just taking a shot, you know, rather than just having kind of a boring card in there. Um, Unburial Rights is out for Min Minsk and Boo, which we talked about being very powerful. Also a little weird with the color correcting, maybe just trying to give green red a little bit more of a bump. <clears throat> Findhorn Elves is out. That's a functional reprint of Llanowar Elves. There are a ton of elves, so losing one isn't really that bad. And Mishra's Bobble's in. Love Mishra's Bobble. I, uh, <clears throat> I just trophied with a, with a deck. It was an Esper Luris deck where I third picked Luris and just drafted completely around it. And it, it, it was sick. Nice. That's sweet. Um, Firebolt is out. That That's the sorcery that does two damage. Uh, for red and you can flash it back for four and a red and in is somehow rolling earthquake which really stood out to me as like what are you doing here but maybe i'm overlooking something it's red x for a sorcery it does x damage to each creature without horsemanship so each creature and each player so so horsemanship is the portal three kingdoms version of flying right but because this card just works as written it basically is red X deals X to each player and each each creature. There's no, there's no horsemanship creatures in the in the cube. I don't uh -huh. think. No. So it's a it's a much stronger earthquake because okay. it it kills everything, including flyers for red X. I think it's just a fine playable. Who wants it? Red, red yeah, red, I think like red red loot's fine in. Okay. If you're some other red based deck that isn't super aggressive, I wouldn't put it in your mono red deck. No. Okay. <laughs> couple of uh, modern classics, I would call them, have left. Uh, the first one, I, I'll actually miss this one. It's Gaunty Lord of Luxury. Oh, this is one of the ones I miss the most, yeah. But you got your new toy. You got Shieldred for Gaunty. Shieldred is amazing. It's it's So it's funny because like when the new cards get added, like Minsk and Boo and Shieldred, I expect there to be a little time before correction. But Shieldred and Minsk are both cards that I think you should be first picking most of the time you see them. Okay. Like, Shieldred is an absurd card. First of all, if it doesn't die, you've got a four or five death touch that's probably clocking them and you're draining you're draining them each turn and gaining two a turn, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. But it also punishes them badly for every card draw. And if you combine it with like draw sevens, it's absurd. I had I played Shieldred and had opponent cast Brainstorm and it was like, oh, it wasn't a great play for you. <laughs> you know, like it's just such a strong card that – you don't need to do anything to make it good. And then if you do make it good by playing, you know, cards like uh, Time Twister or what have you, then it's even better. And I'm I'm really impressed with Shieldred. I think that the yeah. card is great. Yeah, I, I faced down a Shieldred and was in a similar position to your opponent where I was like, well, I've actually got cards that help me get through my library to find the answer for it, but I'll be dead. Like if I cast these two draw spells, I'm just dead anyway. Um, the other one <clears throat> that is no longer in is Geist of St. Traft. Yeah, and it's in for and spell quellers in for that. I think that's a fine a fine uh, swap. Like Geist w was kind of a hard card to fit. Like sometimes you would play it and it would be good, but most of the time it's like I don't really want a purely aggressive card, which is what this is. Right, and it also fits the archetypes that and people generally don't draft blue white aggro. It's not not a thing uh, too often. All right, uh, next one up out is Extraction Specialist, and in for that is Steel Seraph. That's Steel a pretty Seraph cool really, card really for cool. white, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think Steel Seraph is, is very good. Um, you you can cast it – like I wouldn't play it outside the white deck unless you had a really strong artifact theme. But uh, you can cast this card for three mana as a 3-3 three, three flyer that immediately gives something flying and cracks in or gives lifelink. Those are the two most common. Mm -hmm. Or you just cast it for six mana and you're still pretty happy with that too. Gideon Blackblade is out, which – is interesting because I've never been a particular fan, but I respect that card. Like when, oh, when yeah. somebody plays it on three, I'm like, oh no, like that, that thing is going to do a lot of damage to me. It's very difficult to get rid of the control decks. Hate to see it on the other side. And they brought in for it temporary lockdown. I, I'm, I'm, I don't mind having there be an extra, an extra way to kind of deal with aggro starts and it does hit random moxes and stuff, <clears throat> but I don't know how good this card is. How many white, like you'd have to be like white control for this to be good. It's obviously right. not an aggro card. Right. And that to me is the most interesting part is that Gideon, a card that control decks have a hard time against came out 
And they just got temporary lockdown, which ostensibly hoses the decks that Gideon would have been in anyway. So maybe there's a little bit of a nudge at the high levels uh, down at Wizards of the Coast there to, to bump up the control a little bit. A couple of more cards. This one's interesting. Gilded Lotus out. Timeless Lotus in. If you don't I, mind waiting a turn, you get a lot of mana out of this thing. Yeah, and so the reason that I, I like it so much is, and I've been happy with the swap, is one card, Golos. This oh, activates Golos by God. itself. Right, you just need two random land. That's crazy. I had a mono blue deck. It was one of the first cube decks I drafted, actually, where I had a Golos and Timeless Lotus, and Timeless Lotus was the only way to use Golos, and I did it multiple times in the draft. Oh, my God. that's How did, how did Timeless Lotus feel overall? I mean, it's it was obviously okay. very powerful, right? Like, if you yeah, untap I mean, with it. Most of the time with Golos Lotus, you didn't use it right away. It does cut off the Golos Lotus with Counterspell up kind yes, of play. Yes. But I think for the most part... Uh, I would say they're both pretty narrow, and I think it's cool to try Timeless Lotus. I'm not convinced either is actually good in cube, but it was the, the Golos thing is actually fun. Whereas I don't know, I almost never played Golos Lotus. Did you? Did you play that card much? It didn't seem rarely. It's a, it, it was a bit of a win more, right? Like it is. Uh, yeah, if, if you're at that level of mana, it was rare that that was what was going to put you over the top. The only time I ever played it was if I uh, for sure had something I could do that turn with it. You know, like if I had a lot of counter spells or a lot of reactive stuff that I knew I could play this if it resolves then I can still play a kill your thing or whatever then it was pretty good timeless lotus is definitely more interesting though last one is a travesty Th this is the type of thing that only happens when you're forced to do this right which is titania voice of Gaia is in for dryad of the Elysian grove and dryad is kind of a staple and an interesting good playable card that isn't overpowered but isn't under, you know, it's just kind of a card that you see a lot on the battlefield. It does some kind of interesting things sometimes, but Titania, I, 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 I'm just struggling to imagine anybody actually playing the card. No, no, it's, it's not good. And it's going to not be here for too long. Right. And so that's a little bit of a bummer just because, you know, you kind of hope that, uh, <clears throat> that you get to keep, you don't want to punish those cards, but something has to go. Right. Th that's the hard part is that it's very easy for us to read these lists and see what's leaving or what's coming in and just not really recognize, well, then what would you have taken out or what would you have put in? Because this is happening. And I will say that overall, <clears throat> I think this sort of forced rotation is a good thing, actually, for the cube. I think that you can find things that maybe you wouldn't have tried and it helps keep it a little bit fresh. I think the issue comes if you get married to one of these newer cards or any card really, and just aren't willing to look at it. <clears throat> and it brings up the last thing that I wanted to talk about before we head out here, Luis, how much of the vintage cube is uh, nostalgia for you? Um, I mean, definitely some part of it. Like I've been casting, you know, these Riftwind cloud skates and mana leaks in vintage cube for a decade now. Yeah. But but honestly, I love the gameplay. Like, I wouldn't, you know, come back every time it's out and and do so many if the gameplay wasn't also good. Right. And the gameplay really matters. And also, it does evolve. Like, like you said, you know, we talked about it earlier. It's gotten a little faster. There's new puzzles and things. Um, overall, I think the Vintage Cube is a good job of kind of. Sh showing the best magic has to offer in terms of a lot of different aspects. Like it's really fun to draft. It's really fun to play. You do all these broken stuff. I can't fault people who say like, I, I saw some people like Siggy and Newmont were like, uh, the arena cube is better than the vintage cube. And oh God. Yeah. I mean, look, I enjoy both and I don't fault them for that, but I like the vintage cube more. And I understand if, you know, can I fault it, them for that. Well, definitely. I mean, I didn't want to get into the skill differentials needed to, to play the two cubes. And, <laughs> no, but, uh, <laughs> Vintage cube They're on the beginner like cube. <laughs> a lot of what I like, which is casting a bunch of nonsense spells and and w playing decks that are just completely nonsensical, mm -hmm. yet still work. Yeah. And the vintage cube is the best place for me to do that. Uh, I, I I saw someone uh, describe cube as like vintage cube as EDH for comp competitive players. <laughs> And like, you know what? I kind of buy it. It's singleton. Like you draft, you put together this mishmash of cards. You, you have this vision. Like I, you know, that was, a, that was actually a pretty good comparison. And yeah. uh, I, I don't know. I love it. I'm, <clears throat> I'm on balance. Glad it's not always here. It's only up a, what, two, three times a year or something like that. Mm -hmm. But that feels like enough for me to get my cube fixed, but all not, not where it gets stale 
or a gym at all the time. Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, my favorite thing about Vintage Cube, it's really about any cube, but it's much more so in Vintage Cube are like two card combos, right? Not not like literally I just win the game. There's there's few, very few, if any of those that are just straight up two cards, you know, Splinter Twin or something like that. But I like the, you know, I remember, I think it was you or somebody showed me the um, Urza with, what's it called? Uh, Winter Orb. Yeah. You know, like... That is cool, right? You have to take oh, yeah. some risk to do that. Urza is just good and you can just play it. But, you know, most decks don't want Winter Orb. But if you set up that one-two punch, it's really powerful. And it's like, oh, I did it. You know, you set up the thing. And there's a bunch of those that are, that there's more copies of those type of cards. Like, I'm a big fan of the draw seven and Narset combos. I think that those are really tension-filled. When somebody plays a Narset, I'm very aware that they may be trying to run that on me. And so I'm going to use as much resources as I can to get Narset off the battlefield. Last night I was playing and I had a scenario where my opponent played Narset minus it. They didn't find a draw seven, but I knew that they had one in their deck from earlier. And I didn't know if they had it in their hand. And I had a turn where I had my noble hierarch out and I could play a four mana spell or attack Narset down to two in case they didn't have it so that if they wanted to use Narset to try to find something, then they would have to kill Narset instead. And I chose to do that. And that's like, that's because of those two card combos, not because Narset's so great. Like I would have been better off just having a four drop on the battlefield there. But I'm like, if I leave my, let my opponent have this and I just say, go, they get like, they get to look at five cards to try to find their Eons Torn or whatever that card's, what is that card called? Eon, whatever. Yeah. Uh, you were playing Echo it a bunch less. Echo of the Eons or whatever. You know, and, and if they fire that off, then the game's just over on the spot. So I'm going to have to, to you know, basically sacrifice my whole turn to do one damage to Narset. That is that is interesting to me. That is that is really cool. And uh, it, it lends a real tension uh, to the game. And there's a ton of those in the Vintage Cube, and I don't find those nearly as often. Um, but I haven't done the Shieldred one yet, but I'm, I'm in for that too. Also, I feel that Vintage Cube is the best at... Um, the unknown. There's a lot of turns like when you draft your your patented Stormless Storm deck um, where y you don't know that you're going to win yet, right? Like you, you do a yeah. sequence of plays that puts you in a good position. It'll sh show you a lot of cards. A lot of things can happen, but you have to kind of have faith in that. You got to trust the process, right? And like you just do the things that you need to do and then hope that it all works out. And I find that that happens a lot more in the draft portion and the game portion in Vintage Cube than any other format. And uh, I really like that part too. So um, why don't we call it a show there, Luis? I know you got a meeting to get to, but um, everybody go play that thing and show us oh, your so decks. Fun. It oh, is also, so fun. I, I do want to shout out what, what I think is the current, my current favorite combo and very, very strong Underworld Breach, Lion's Eye Diamond, Brain Freeze. It's a three card combo and Lion's Eye Diamond and Brain Freeze don't do much on their own, but uh -huh. it's effectively a two mana win the game combo. You can do this as early as turn two. So what happens? You you ditch your whole hand. Oh wow! So you play you play Breach mm -hmm. and you crack at Lion's Eye, and then this is the the very basic version. And then you you remove three cards out of your graveyard to cast Brain Freeze, and you just target yourself, uh -huh. and then you mill yourself for nine. Play Lion's Eye, tw you know, twice more of using six of those cards. Then play Brain Freeze using the other three. And now you're casting a, a Brain Freeze for six, and you can either fill your graveyard or just mill them out. It's, it, I mean, it's good enough for Vintage. Like, Bre Breach is a Brain That's Freeze insane. is a deck in Vintage. And, and the, the cool part about this is, yes, it's Black Lotus obviously would be better than Lion's Eye Diamond, but sometimes LED is even better because it lets you discard lands to use for Breach. But most importantly, you can get all three of these cards 10th pick. Yeah, I mean, not totally. if I'm in the draft, but like you can. I mean, <laughs> I, the last time I streamed, I drafted two Breach Brain Freeze LED decks. I trophied with the first, went two one with the second. But the second one, I also got Brain Freeze and Underworld Breach pick seven and eight in pack three or whatever. Oh wow! Oh, like the last two chances. Yeah, you had or LED and cool. Brain Freeze. Whatever the two I got were very late. So okay. Yeah. And I mean, to the people who are casting. Llanowar Elves on turn one, right? There's a lot more to this cube. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, they're not looking at the Underworld Breach. That's awesome. All right. Well, everybody have fun uh, playing Vintage Cube. We'll be back next week with the Limmies. We're going to be doing our year-end thing next week, giving away the awards and all that kind of stuff. If you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR. You can find everything related to the podcast 
over at LRCast.com. We want to thank our sponsor, TCG Player and Channel Fireball, for their support of the show. And uh, yeah, with that, we'll see you next week. So we had a, a, an adventure this week on uh, Tuesday. There was a little dog snuffling around on our porch. Uh-oh. And I go outside, and there's just no one around. And oh, yep, yep, you lift the dog right on cue. <laughs> it's just, it's just this, this little dude, uh, uh, apparently a Shih Tzu, and – was very friendly, a little, little, a little tentative, but came inside and had a caller, but the caller didn't have a, his name or contact info. It did have his vet info on it. It's just rabies. Oh, uh-huh. So we took the dog to our vet to see if he was microchipped. He wasn't. Um, we then called their vet. They didn't pick up, but we decided to drive over. It was about 20 minutes away. We went to the vet and they, they had the owner's info, but they couldn't give us the owner's contact info, I guess, because of privacy. But they said they could keep the dog there and... And they would try to get a hold of the owner. So we're like, okay, that sounds reasonable. And they right? would but let like, you know what happened, hopefully? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then then we call back the next day and a little guy who we, who we named Toby, by the way, just, just you know, uh-huh. he seemed like a Toby, um, uh-huh. wasn't really eating much and wasn't – and was being kind of aggressive in like in a cage. He was showing cage aggression where when you put him in a cage, he starts getting more like worked up. Oh, okay. And they hadn't been able to get a contact the owner. And um, so we're like – we were pretty bummed. But – what Gabby had done is post on Nextdoor and Facebook, a bunch of the local Facebook groups here, hey, we found this dog. Yeah. And someone who saw that saw the owner's post of, hey, my friend, my roommate lost his dog in a picture and they cross-posted it. It looked like the same dog. So we call and uh, luckily the – actually, the, the guy only spoke Spanish but, but you know, so, so, do, so do we. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and apparently the, the dog's name was Barbas. Uh, Barba oh. means beard. He had, he had a little nice little beard. Oh. <laughs> Uh, and they they were so happy, and they they drove to the vet to go pick him up. So Barbas oh, got reunited. Oh my god, what a great before ending! This, before this negative fifteen degree cold snap, you know. Oh. But apparently uh, he had wandered uh, off of uh, the work site. His 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 owner had taken him to work, and he had escaped, and and was just wandering around. But luckily, through the, the, the power of social media, we were able to connect, and uh, oh. Barbas is back home. So what a great happy, ending! Happy holidays to Barbas. Uh, cute cute little guy. But, <laughs>